my name is Patty Ellison and I became a master gardener in 2012. It was my reward to myself for getting both of my children into the public school system without a visit from social services or the police. I participate in a number of different programs. One of the things I like to do is teach and the Master Gardener training program has given me the opportunity to share some of what I have learned. For that, I thank them. There is a cheat sheet at the end of the slideshow. It has a plant list. Sit back and enjoy a lecture on vegetable gardens and the things that I have tried in my garden. Everybody always wants to know what my garden looks like. Here it is. It's not too big and it has not been cleaned out yet. I hope my garden will look differently in about two weeks. Why does my garden look like this? Because it's too early. I am having a very hard time staying inside. I feel like the weather is going to go from too cold and wet to way too hot and humid. This change seems to happen overnight. I did indulge myself with a small collection of sticks. I put them in an old rusty tomato cage. This way, any sleeping bugs can crawl out and become bird food for the many birds that nest in my yard. How does this help my vegetable garden, you might ask? Well, the bugs have to go somewhere to overwinter. And if I clean up my yard too early, then they get thrown out like trash, which is not what they are. And the best practice is to leave your leaves. The next best practice is to put the leaves somewhere on your property that will not bother the neighbors and compost them. Let's start learning about vegetable gardening. I know, I know. Everybody wants to see pictures of beautiful tomatoes and luscious sun-warmed cucumbers fresh from the vine, but unfortunately we have to start with some less glamorous information first. How soon can you start? I'm afraid the answer is not tomorrow because our frost-free date is not until April 1st through the 15th. The easy way to remember our frost-free date is don't be an April fool and plant your tomatoes before you pay your taxes. Don't get me wrong, you can still purchase plants before your frost-free date. Stores will be happy to sell to you. If you plant too early, you may have to replace your warm season plants if they have been nipped by a frost. Usually warm season plants will have stunted growth and never really recover. Most, but not all, cold season plants are usually fine if the frost is brief. I would caution you not to plant anything until after April 1st at the earliest. If this is the only time you can plant, then be prepared to keep a sharp eye on the weather and rush out with a cover if the weather dips too close to freezing. The only exception to this piece of advice is if your neighborhood has an elderly gardener and he or she is out planting in their vegetable garden. They might know something you don't. Talk to them and find out what it is. Boy, gardening season goes by quickly when you're having fun. The average Virginia first frost date is the average end of our growing season. I remember it is close to Halloween. Most years, there will be a light frost for a day or two and then it will warm up. Your plants might be fine if you cover them up with an old sheet. Some years, this means you can get another two weeks of fresh lettuce before nighttime temperatures make this a regular irritating chore. There are a few crops that taste better after a frost, and some plants will survive happily under a row cover all winter long. Once spring arrives, they will return to a more vigorous growth. Knowing that the end of gardening season is around October 11th through October 20th allows you to figure out the number of growing days in our season. If you subtract the April 1st date from October 20th, it is close to 200 days. If you want to grow something that takes close to 250 days, you will need to learn some season extending tricks or move further south. Assuming you plan to stay on the peninsula and not move, the next bit of information you will need to learn about is plant hardiness zones. Plant hardiness zones refer to how tough your plant is. In our area, that number is zone 8A. If you have your plant tucked into the ground with a nice layer of mulch, your plant should survive until the weather goes below 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. This is not a hard and fast guarantee. If your plant is in a pot, it will probably have a problem at 20 to 25 degrees or one zone, zone warmer. You can also cheat if you know your yard very well and have a nice southern 
facing brick wall up against your house. This is a microclimate. I have not found the space in my yard where this applies. However, if you have children at Grafton Bethel Elementary School, the Grizzly Getaway Garden is a microclimate. Spring comes two weeks earlier than at my house, which is a mere one and a half miles away. Knowing your plant hardiness zone makes gardening a lot less expensive. Plants have evolved to grow well at certain temperatures. For example, this ornamental kale has gotten too hot and it is bolting. It wants to put out flowers, then seeds before it dies. I have enjoyed this plant all winter, but I would be unhappy if I had just planted it this spring. And it is now only a month later. Nurseries are in the business to sell plants and they will often place plants out for sale before you can successfully grow the crop. It can be too cold or too hot. But you say, I can defeat mother nature, I know I can. Then you will need to learn about cold frames and row covers. They will provide you with ways to keep the ground and the surrounding air just a bit warmer which can allow you to harvest vegetables past the first hard freeze or start a bit early. Some of that lettuce was eaten for Christmas dinner. You will need to be careful on warm days as you can cook your plants under a cold frame. I'm not going to talk any more on this subject as you now know the terms needed for a YouTube search. There are many videos on this subject all over the internet. Just don't burn your house down with old Christmas lights or light bulbs under row covers. You have been warned. Hopefully by now you are ready to warm up your knowledge about vegetable gardening needs. You need to know about the sunlight in your yard. The amount of sunlight needed to grow vegetables is eight to 10 hours per day. Plants generally feel more light is better as long as they have enough water. Six hours is the minimum amount of sunlight that you can get away with. If you have only six hours of sunlight, you should look for more leafy greens and less at tropical plants, but don't give up. I would be happy to be proven wrong. I did a sun study in my garden a number of years ago. I drew my garden and gave each raised bed a number. I set the kitchen timer at one hour all day long. Every hour I went out and looked to see if the bed was in sun or not. It took me two days to do this. At the end, I knew the best place to put my vegetable garden. It was along the side of my house in the front yard, Fortunately, I do not have a homeowner's association. Now that I know where the sunny and shady spots are in my garden, I can put that knowledge to work. I can find north in my yard without looking for the moss on the side of a tree. If you know which way north is in your garden, you will know where to plant tall vegetables so they do not overshadow shorter plants. This is a two-way street. You can prolong the life of cold weather vegetables if they can receive some relief from the sun. You now know that you are planting your vegetable garden in zone 8A and how to find north. You are ready to start a vegetable garden and all of the grass on your property is taking up valuable real, sunny real estate. After all, who can eat grass? Why grow it? Please, please start small with your garden. It is much easier to succeed and learn a little bit at a time rather than everything at once. I have been gardening at my house for almost 20 years. Some of these pictures are a little old. Both of those boys are now taller than me. These cute little boys are much harder to get into the garden. It's a good thing I designed my garden to make me happy and I like color, lots of color. This is why what my garden looked like when I first started out. It had a sandbox in it and a swing set. Time has passed and the swing set has been removed and a native garden has been installed. The sandbox is now a bird bath. The rain barrel is now a 55 gallon drum with ladybugs painted on it. I've also dug up everything and rearranged re re it at least three times. Gardens should change, unlike the furniture in your house. You cannot claim failure as a gardener unless you have killed a plant seven times. You also cannot claim failure if you keep planting that plant in the same spot. There is something about that spot that plant doesn't like. Keep changing things up until you find what works for you. This is what has worked for me. Here are a few pictures of my garden. 
It is not a first year garden. This picture was taken in the spring. You can tell because the plants are fairly well behaved and I have not killed my zucchini plant yet. I like a style of gardening called cottage garden or a pottager. It is a mix of flowers and vegetables. It can get unruly toward the end of summer. This is a sketch of my garden at its largest size. My garden does not look like this anymore. It was way too much for me to take care of, so I changed it. The upper right-hand section is now in an, an in-ground native garden. The wheelbarrow is still there, and the three end beds will be dug up and put into large pots or containers. My oldest son is learning to drive, and he needs to be able to see the end of the turnaround on our driveway. I have chosen red or white pots, which will hopefully be reflective and not get hit. My garden is changing as my needs change. Stay with, still with me in wanting a garden? I will assume, assume so as you are watching this recording. Now it is time to talk about some of the least glamorous needs that a garden has, water, nutrients, and pest control. Just a moment, page out of order. First on that list is watering. My garden is getting a new watering system this spring. I cannot wait. It will be a drip system and on a timer. I have dug up my old system and not yet installed my new system. Sorry, no pictures for that project. That is on next week's to-do list. Before you ask who made my watering system, I need to point out that Master Gardeners don't endorse products and I'm not supposed to name names. What is important about my watering system is that I use it and it doesn't waste water. Your watering system could be a soaker hose, a sprinkler, or a watering can. Your garden will need about one inch of water or rain per week until the plants begin to fruit. Once fruiting has started, your vegetables will want between two and three inches of water per week. This is easy to supplement with rain, but watch your rain gauge come August or end of July. The majority of the nutrient management that I do is in the form of compost. My garden is organic. It does not use chemicals. I feed the soil, which in turn feeds my plants. My garden has raised beds. My garden is a place I go to relax. It is not perfect. There are weeds and some minor bug damage. My garden will be different than your garden. Enjoy that. Before you ask, I do use amendments in my garden and I do fertilize with fish fertilizer, but not on days I have company. All things considered, my garden does not have a lot of pests. These insects or bugs are not pests. For my children, they were playmates to be watched. And for me, some of them were pest control. The first step for pest control is to figure out what the insect is, then explore how to treat it if treatment is needed. Organic pest control can be addressed several different ways. You can hand pick bugs and put them in a cup of soapy water. Too squeamish for that? Then you can choose resistant varieties of plants to help control disease. You can practice IPM or integrated pest management, a whole separate topic. There are organic products that treat disease or pests, which are very similar to non-organic chemical controls, but decide if you need to treat before applying a chemical just because you saw a bug. I am sure you can tell I work with a lot of children. The first thing I teach them about caterpillars is hairy be wary. In other words, don't play with the hairy or fuzzy caterpillars. Those are the general type of caterpillar that will most likely give a human a reaction. The small snake in the garden glove is harmless. He was asleep in the mulch when we found him. We put him back. The brightly colored spider in the lower left-hand corner is made of Lego and was at the Virginia Living Museum. Again, not a problem. The caterpillar on the lower right-hand picture sitting on a leaf is having a very bad day. A parasitic wasp has laid eggs on him. Organic pest control at its best. Nature has provided the treatment.
It is important to rotate your crops from year to year. Plants have different families. Move the families into different areas each year. This can help to braze, break a disease cycle or interrupt a pest problem. Crop rotation is needed after year one and should be done in four or five year cycles. If you plant the same thing in the same area every year, is it really an annual or have you turned that plant into a perennial from the perspective of a bug? My garden has problems with raccoons, turtles, moles, voles, squirrels, rabbits, and basketballs. It also has a problem with aphids, squash bugs, Japanese beetles, vine borers, and cutworms. I have chosen to exclude some of the critters with fencing and stinky fertilizer. That has helped some. For bugs, I squash them or hand pick when I can find them. Mostly, I plant resistant varieties of vegetables. I also pay one penny per bug and 10 cents for eggs. There's nothing like counting out 134 wet, soggy squash bugs. Best dollar 34 spent in a long time. Probably the worst problem I have in my garden is moles and voles. Voles are meat eaters. They go after grubs and worms. Moles are the ones who dig the tunnels in your yard or garden. Moles are also more solitary creatures. You probably only have one. Voles are vegetarians. They eat roots and some plants, but mostly roots. Voles are opportunists. They run the tunnels of moles. You can choose to share or not with voles. If you remove the food source, both creatures will go elsewhere looking for food. I have tried just about every method on the market and on YouTube to control voles, most of which are not Master Gardener approved. Some years are better than other years. My garden has less of a problem than my bird feeders with raccoons. This is the largest raccoon the fancy bird store has ever seen. It is raiding the bird feeder on my fancy feeder setup. They do not sell a larger baffle. So sometimes you have no choice but to share. Even though I live in Yorktown, I do not have a problem with deer. I am lucky. You have two choices when it comes to deer. You can choose to share what you grow or not share. A hungry deer will eat anything and everything. Very tall fences are the best way to exclude deer from your garden. If you cannot install an eight foot fence, then do a little research on how far apart two shorter fences need to be. Most deer will not enter an area if they cannot quickly get out. If a good fence is out of your price range, then look for a community or church garden that has a fence. Make sure to close and secure the gate. The Pecosin Learning Garden has a deer problem. Please visit to look at some of their solutions. There are a number of products on the market to help with the deer problem. A large number of books has been written on this subject. But really the best way to deal with the deer problem is to make your yard or garden less friendly to deer than your neighbor's yard. I also deal with escaping chickens, snapping turtles, and squirrels. At this point, I just share or spend a lot of time and effort running around waving my arms and generally looking like a crazy lady. I prefer to have nice garden helpers. Still want a vegetable garden? Yes. What type of garden do you want? Straw bale garden, container garden, raised bed garden, traditional row style, in the ground garden, the list can be endless. The library has a large selection of books on these different styles of gardening. I've offered to tell you about how to start a vegetable garden, but I cannot make all the choices for your garden. That wouldn't be any fun for you. If you want to look at and touch some of the different styles of vegetable gardening, go to the Pecosin Learning Garden. The master gardeners have put in a nice, large, full sun garden that is mostly a vegetable garden. It has a straw bale section, several different styles of raised beds, and even gardens that address accessibility needs. 
when you go to the Pocosin Learning Garden, plan to spend a little extra time to check out the Bluebird Trail and the Marsh Walk. Now that the difficult choice of what type of garden is done, you will need to choose seeds or plants. There are three basic types of seeds, open pollinated seeds or heirloom seeds, are varieties of seed which has been grown for a long time. I think the common definition is cultivars or plants that have been around since before the 1950s. Assuming you do not have a problem with cross-pollination, you can collect those seeds and save them for the next year. They will look like the parent plant. Heirloom plants were selected for taste and generally not for their ability to go to market on a truck. They can have pest problems. Most hybrid plants will not grow true to saved seed. You will need to purchase new seed every time you run out. Many hybrid seeds have been bred to resist our pest or disease factors in the South. These traits will make your life much easier. Heirloom or hybrid on the packaging has nothing to do with organic or not. That is a personal choice. We do not need to address GMO seeds as they are not generally, they are not available to the general public for sale. All seed packets come with a good set of directions on them. They work best if you read and follow the directions. Please also consider what happens when you plant a whole packet of seeds. You will get a huge crop all at once. You can space and time out your plantings or just save the extra seeds for next year. Nobody wants hundreds of zucchinis all at once. Did somebody say zucchini? This zucchini will produce summer or winter squash, depending on when you pick it. It also lasts forever once it is cured. However, it's a really big plant, and it has been in to take over the yard, garden, and the neighbor's car. I would never have known this had I not tried it. Your garden should be a space where you can experiment. Stay with me. We're almost to the end of this talk. Where are you going to get your plants? You can raise them from seed, purchase them from a store or a garden center. You can even plant straight seeds straight into your new garden. Don't want to leave your house because of COVID-19? Plants or seeds can be ordered online. A source can be easily found for the determined gardener. I like heirloom vegetables, which are rarely found in a big box store. Therefore, I raise many of my plants from seed. This process starts one week after Valentine's Day and lasts until the beginning of April with a second wave lasting into May. What this really means is I lose my kitchen cart counter for about three months. I think it is worth it. For a first year gardener, I would recommend buy buying plant starts. It removes a single step of your learning curve. The last topic we will touch on is to support your plants. If you have plants that are labeled pole, runner, vining, or needs a trellis, then build a trellis or bean teepee. If you want to plant tomatoes, you will need a support system. Keeping some plants away from the soil will help with disease control. Do you know what grows at the top of an eight foot tall trellis? Beans you cannot reach. You can grow almost anything you want. Just make sure you like to eat what you grow. It took me several years of growing eggplant before I decided I just don't like eggplant. Some plants grow better in different seasons. Lettuce, spinach, and peas are good examples of spring or fall crops, but not summer crops. Plant vegetables and herbs that are expensive to purchase at the grocery store. Enough basil to make pesto fits that example. Plant vegetables that are best eaten straight out of the sun-warmed garden. Nothing tastes better than a sun-warmed tomato. Here is a list of some of the vegetables that I grow. You can find this list on the library's website. I won't go over this page because you can read about it and I'm sure that folks would like some time for questions. If you enjoyed this lecture, please let the library know. If you would like to have the lecture on different topics or more about gardens, please let the Master Gardeners know. Put a request in the chat box. If you are now ready to become a Master Gardener and meet more like-minded folks, please keep an eye out on the Virginia Cooperative Extension website or on Facebook at the 
York Pocosin Master Gardener Group for our fall training program. Application should be out on April 28th, and the first class will start around August 18th until November 10th. It will be online training at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings with some optional field trips. Again, thank you for coming to my talk on vegetable gardens. Are there any questions? So Patty, um, only one person has been asking questions, but I've pretty much answered them. Oh, here comes one. So um, we have a listener who is asking about mushroom compost. I guess opinion about it, knowledge about it. Um, I haven't worked with it. I Mushrooms are pretty picky about what they grow in, so it should be good stuff. I just use compost from the dump. So um, two people are asking how tall your trellis, <coughs> excuse me, should be for growing tomatoes and cucumbers. Um, most of my trellises are hmm, probably f not more than four feet because the plant can grow up one side and down the other. It doesn't care, um, but I can't harvest produce from something that is two feet above my head. Uh, tomatoes, I use tomato cages and tomatoes come in two different types. There is a type that is called determinant and it knows what it wants to be. It wants to be a certain size and it will probably produce two crops worth of tomatoes in our area. That's the type of tomato that you want to go after if you're a canner. And those generally are Roma style tomatoes, but there are other breeds that fit a determinate description and they will be a single size plant when they're fully mature. Indeterminate tomatoes, don't know what they want to be so they keep growing and growing and growing and they're huge um, and they will produce a little bit of a crop all summer long as opposed to just at one time and i would say um depending on what you have i have a trellis that is well over my head but my husband is six foot tall so he can get the other ones um and i actually made um a trellis. Um, you made an arbor? Arch. Yeah, an arbor. Um, and it was really great because there was a lot of space. The only problem is at the very end, um, when I was kind of ignoring it, getting ready to go back to school and all of that, there were all these tomatoes at the top that were like, you know, splitting and busting. And, you know, so it's like, you know, you're going to get bombed by tomatoes at the end. But, um, but I agree with Patty, um, just make sure that you can reach whatever you plant because either one of those tomatoes or cucumbers, they're just gonna keep growing. To, uh, cucumbers usually kind of fizzle out um, in August, I think. It gets too hot, they get funky, the boars um, get them. So if you want those, then you need to do um, plantings later um, to get you know, a new new batch of cucumber plants. Um, somebody's asking how far apart do you plant tomatoes? Oh, I'm sorry. It sounds like Nate's speaking. Yeah, I was, I was just going to add one thing there, if you don't mind. Um, remember that tomatoes uh, will only produce when nighttime temperatures drop below 70 degrees. So in the heat of our summers, we don't get enough of a temperature drop, drop below 70 degrees. And so that's why in typically in August, you'll see a pause in your tomato production. Don't worry about that so much because come September, when the uh, nighttime temperatures start dropping below 70 degrees, you'll see a fresh new uh, round of production out of your tomato plants as we get back into that cycle. And, uh, and you're exactly right about the cucumbers. With most of your vegetables, remember that um, if you want to continue having good production out of them, you need to harvest the fruit. If you allow your cucumbers to get really big and, and then they'll start turning a, a uh, yellowish color, they are sending a, um, a message using hormones back to the rest of the plants wow. that 
we have already uh, produced all the seeds that we need to produce and we're done producing. Uh, so you can stop producing fruit. And, um, and so the plant will shut down and not produce as much. So it's really important that you pick those in a timely manner. And that's it, thank you. So if your tomatoes go to seed or if your cucumbers or zucchini or whatever you didn't pick enough of quickly enough, we'll probably have seed saving as a fall topic. So come back and join us then. Uh, for the person who's asking how far apart um, to plant your tomatoes in a square foot garden, um, they say 12 feet, I mean, 12, you know, one per square. I don't do that. Yeah, I don't either. Um, the most tomatoes I plant in a four foot square are four tomatoes. Um, I usually tend to group them in the center of the square because they're going to flop everywhere, even if you get a good cage. And then I companion plant basil and um, marigolds with them because both of those plants will help each other. The marigolds help with pest control because they're kind of stinky. And the basil and the tomatoes complement each other and both will taste better at the end. Um, there, Carrots are also a good companion plant for tomatoes. Okay. Um, there is a style of tomatoes where you heavily prune your stems and you like weave them through a trellis. I think the name of that is called the Florida weave. And you might be able to get away with one per square, but I really think that's too tight. You're going to end up with a hot tangled mess in the end of September and a lot of disease. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the most, when I'm being um, piggy, I would say 18 inches, um, but but she's right. It, you know, think about how the weather is here. Um, you know, we'll have this huge, like it's raining all the time and then it gets humid and that's the perfect place to breed any kind of funk, fungus, um, you know, any kind of disease. And then it'll get really, really hot. And um, then there's no, um, you know, no moisture. And so, um, with all that disease, it's better if it's, you know, airy and not all clumped in together. So if you can control yourself um, and spread them out a little bit more, I will say I do not use tomato um, cages anymore for tomatoes because they were so frustrating. They were always falling over. So I trellis um, like the square foot gardening book has um, that Nate talked about last time. And um, I use my tomato cages for my pepper plants and that helps a lot. Um, Patty, I, I see there are like nine more questions here. Um, what, what type of mulch um, material is best to deter bugs? That's a mixed answer. Um, I am in the process of switching my garden completely over to leaf mulch. So I run everything through the lawnmower in the fall and I spread it out all over the garden and I dump extra in the beds during the year um, to overwinter. So far that has been really successful in controlling weeds. Um, if you don't have a supply of uh, leaves right now, you can use straw. Um, you wanna make sure that it doesn't have seed heads in it because then you're gonna be picking a crop of wheat. Um, I have tried using grass clippings and I cannot recommend that because then I had to pull grass out of my beds. Um, I frequently, or I had been using um, the mulch fines from the dump and that worked really well. Um, I think really kind of more what I use the mulch for is to control moisture and to cut down on watering and to keep my watering more evenly, you know, more even in the season. 
Um, that's where a lot of the diseases come from in tomatoes. So if the first crop of tomatoes you have ends up with a black spot on the bottom and gets all mushy and yucky, that is blossom end rot. Um, you can throw down a little calcium, but really what you need to do is even out your watering and that problem will go away. And then if your tomatoes split, that's because I got too much water too quickly. So you can't always win. Um, but I do really recommend that you mulch with whatever product you want to try. Um, somebody is asking about, um, they try to avoid the splashing the water on their tomatoes, but they still get blight. So are there tricks to avoid that? Uh, move. I, I don't know any. Um, I am unwilling to spray the chemicals needed to deal with that. And that is just in our air and in our soil. And there's really nothing you can do about it. Even if you are super good about not splashing water on your tomatoes, if your neighbor isn't, it's going to be, you know, it's just in the area. Um, I go after disease resistant varieties. If you are trying to compare last year's tomato crop, last year was horrible for tomatoes. I mean, it just, I didn't do very well at all. Um, see what I grow on the tomato list. Because I just got a oh, new one. Of the other things, is, is blight one of the ones that lives in the soil? So crop rotation might help? Um, by literally just planting in another uh, box or area? I th that, that always helps. Um, starting with fresh soil would help. Um, more, I think some of the crop rotation has to do with nematoids. And if when at the end of the gardening season and you pull up your dead plants, if the roots look like they've got knobby bits on them, like arthritic um, knuckles and, and joints on, on me, um, <laughs> then you've got root knot nematoids. And there are products you can do to, uh, or, you know, you can put down to help with that, but really it's better if you just move the plants. And I tried that last year and I need to do it again this year. Um, so some people are asking, what do you do about vine borers um, in squash plants? And then the next one is, is there effective organic treatment for squash bugs and um, Colorado potato bugs that attack eggplants. Okay, I can answer some of the squash bug plant questions. I can't answer anything on eggplant because I don't grow eggplant anymore. Uh, the best eggplant I ever got was interplanted amongst green beans. I planted green beans around the outside of the bed and eggplant in the middle, and they were huge, beautiful eggplant. And that was the year I learned that I don't like eggplant. Um, squash bugs. Okay, so remember how I said you have seven times you can plant a plant and kill it before you say you can't grow it? Well, that's me and zucchini. I have planted zucchini all over my garden in any number of varieties. And the only variety that I can find that I can grow successfully is a variety that's called um, zucchini rampicante. It's on the list. There's only one under squash. Um, that plant gets squash bugs. It gets powdery mildew. It gets vine borers. But because it is so big and I let it run along the ground, it doesn't care about any of those things. It just kind of goes, eh. I'll just keep growing. Um, that's the plant that I showed you the two different styles. So if you pick it when it's young, you can use it just like regular green zucchini. If you pick it once you can't dent it with your fingernail, it'll last for like nine months in your house, wherever you store it. I put it in the bathtub and I like literally nine months later, I still had winter, winter zucchini. Um, 
I don't treat anything in my garden. Um, I will hand pick bugs. I knock them into soapy water. If you can get a, on top of that quick enough, sometimes you're able to control it. If you don't, really look for the neighborhood kid and pay them a penny a bug. You just have to count them when they're wet and soapy. Um, cutworms. So a cutworm is going to go after your plant when it's really young. And that worm has to be able to wrap all the way around the stem of a little tiny plant. And so my solution for that is to plant the plant and put one or two toothpicks on either side. And then that makes the stem too wide for the cutworm to circle and it doesn't go after it. Um, the, uh, what's the other one? Um, vine bores. I haven't had a lot of success with those. You can take a clean, sharp pocket knife and slit the stem of the plant, go in, stab the white worm, pull it out, um, close everything up and put some soil on top of it. But if you're growing that giant zucchini rampicane, it really doesn't care because it will have rooted on either side of that into the ground. But you're also talking about dealing with a plant that happily gets 20 feet long. And if I plant that and put it on a trellis, then I lose the benefit of the plant rerooting along the stem because it can't if it's up in the air. That was the year I killed the zucchini very quickly. All right, somebody is asking, do you take the suckers off your tomatoes? I do if they're too close together, then I'm trying to not have the tangled mass. Do you, Patty? I don't. I stop doing it. I do it at the beginning, like I'm going to forever, and then I end up not doing it because it's too hot. And How about a uh, till or no till system with your raised beds? Um, I'm pretty much no till. Um, mo you know, I've never had a tiller, so that's one thing. Secondly, um, it's only four feet square. And you know, I don't, I don't stir up a lot of stuff because when you stir up your soil, you're losing some of the structure. I also don't walk in the middle of my beds, which is really important is to not walk all over everything. Um, the, I, I will top dress with compost, but I don't go stomping around in there and I don't till, it's too much work. Somebody's asking about um, that black garden weed cloth um, and somebody else mentioned um, putting down weed guard plastic and then mulching it over with pine straw. He had had success with that, but then somebody else was asking about that black weed cloth. Um, I think it depends on what you are trying to prevent. Um, my garden, I, you know, I've had my garden in this spot for like 20 years so yes, it has weeds. It doesn't have a whole lot of weeds. Um, I don't like putting down plastic because it's gonna degrade over time and then you can't remove it. If you put the weed barrier down, it works great for a couple of years and then you start putting mulch on top of it and then you get a really nice soil on top of it. And then the weeds just fall in there. So you're still pulling stuff up. Um, if I need to kill off grass in an area, I will put down a layer of cardboard. I'll water everything first, put down a layer of cardboard, maybe put down some newspaper if I'm feeling enthusiastic, and then cover that with a layer of mulch so that it doesn't blow around the neighborhood. And that will kill off the grass underneath it and still allow worms to go through everything because the cardboard and newspaper will biodegrade. Uh, newspaper that you use is all printed with soy ink now and as long as it's not the shiny advertising sections in the paper you're fine. You don't have to worry about that. Patty, may I jump in for a second? Mm -hmm. 
Sure. So there, there's also a uh, product that looks a lot like plastic uh, ground cover, and but it's actually made out of cornstarch. And it's biodegradable. It'll completely break down in the garden. I've used it a couple of years now, and it really helps to warm up the soil, which is something that you're looking for when you start planting your vegetables in the, in the garden. You don't want to do that before the soil temperature is about 50 degrees. Um, so in, in mid-April, when we're all planting out our gardens, it really helps raise up that soil temperature and give those plants a, a better start there. And then by the end of the season, that has all broken down there. But what I don't have to uh, deal with are the weeds coming up. Um, you can buy it. I think it comes in four foot wide uh, sections. And uh, I think the smallest portion that you can get is about 50 feet long. I know that um, it's more difficult to find at the big box stores, but you can. There are some uh, local um, vendors where you can find it. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that you can get it at most local garden supply stores or the gardener's workshop or places like that. And it, it tends to work quite well. Uh, shade cloth, the reason why I don't like that is uh, stuff piles up on top of that for exactly the same reason that Patty talked about. And then you, you start getting uh, start getting weeds that are growing on top of it. So it, um, it, it, the shade cloth on top is not really worked quite as well for me. I've also had to pull up a lot of landscaping cloth out of school gardens because whoever puts it down the first time puts plants in one location and then you want to put something in a different location and you either can't get through the stuff or it's in the way or whatever. So I don't use it. Um, the only other question that I think I see is um, Brian is asking, how would you coordinate a small worm composting system with a regular compost bin? Can one type of compost feed the other or would they be two separate things? And I'm not sure that we're the ones to ask. I don't know. Okay, so I have a worm bin. I have played with that for a number of years. Um, that it, worm bins produce really, really nice compost. And I would not mix it in with your regular compost in your pile. I would take the worm compost and put it straight in your garden. That's where you're going to get the most benefit of it. Um, you can mix it with water if you want a liquid fertilizer that's easier to put out. Um, otherwise, I have a very lazy compost pile. It just kind of goes away over time. Um, I put weed see, you know, I put weeds in it, I put grass in it. It gets a little bit of leaves, but not a whole lot. Um, I have another pile in the backyard that my chickens are adamant must be as flat as possible. So that gets scooped up and rearranged quite often, depending on energy. But most of my compost comes from the county dump. It's much easier and faster and does not involve harassing teenage boys to turn the pile. Someone is um, asking the best way to grow potatoes, barrel method, or adding to um, a mound. And I, before she answers this, let me tell you a funny story. I, my principal at my school, I'm a teacher, um, said that uh, he doesn't tell his, his elderly parents who um, live with him, but he was um, harvesting. He didn't, he didn't do this on purpose, but in his compost pile, um, were growing potatoes. And so he was feeding them <laughs> the potatoes that were growing out of his compost pile. So sometimes they just plant, you know, they grow a, a place you didn't really expect them to. So um, I'll answer a little bit about tomatoes and then let Nate take over. I haven't had a lot of luck growing regular potatoes down here. I've tried in bags. I've tried mounding the soil up around the potatoes. It just gets too hot here 
if you're going to have things that are out of the ground, but Nate does uh, sweet potatoes and they do a whole lot better for him. So go ahead, Nate. Yeah, th thanks, Patty. Uh, Christy, uh, to your question, I, I completely agree with Patty. Think, uh, when you think of potatoes, you're thinking of more norm northern climates like Idaho or Ireland, where potatoes do quite well. They're, they're very well adapted to colder climates. Despite the name similarity, potatoes and sweet potatoes are not related. The sweet potato is related closely to the morning part. And so, and they're, they're more tropical uh, plants. And so they grow really well in our area. And what you want to do, if you want to be really successful with them, there's a couple different ways to do it. But get one of those really big um, pots. Like they sell them for you know, under 20 bucks at some of the big membership uh, stores that, that, that are in our area. Uh, you can get it for 16, 17 bucks. That's at least 17, 18 inches across. Fill it up with some good compost in there and plant one slip out of a uh, sweet potato right in the center of it. You don't want to plant multiple. In there. And if you want to top dress it with some marigolds around the top because marigolds won't compete with it, that's fine. But what that sweet potato will do is it will fill up that whole pot with, uh, with sweet potatoes over the season at the same time that it's growing large vines out of there. So those will sprawl around. At the end of the season, come November, you know, October, November, all you have to do is um, just uh, turn that pot over and you'll have, it's super easy to, to harvest those sweet potatoes. Couldn't, couldn't be any easier. If you put them to the ground, you're going to have to dig them up, and you can do that. But um, but I found that that uh, pot method just works really well for me. So I know we didn't answer 100% what you wanted to know about potatoes, but in uh, unless you're from an area and you've tasted something that's like fresh out of the ground, potatoes are in my, they're so cheap at the grocery store, I'm not going to mess with it. You know, it could be that I've just never had a super fresh potato and I don't know what I'm missing. Um, but I, I've gone after more high dollar crops or things that I can't purchase easily. And potatoes to me are easy to purchase. Well, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Well, thank you very much for coming. I hope you had a good time. I hope you got information and I didn't go too quick. <laughs>